and opened the door and behind me a voice said don't go and I you know it was chilling and uh, you know I turned around and by the way I thought she and I looked a bit like they were in the days of the big black don't go uh there's something I have to tell you and she put out her hand and I put out mine and I took hers and I said Billy and she said yes and I said wait a minute and because I was scared I had not seen this before and, 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 and doctor if I can just stop yeah. you there just so I yeah. can have the record be clear so when you're referring to things that Billy said, you're using a male voice. Yes, I'm and, and, imitating it as much as I can. Okay, yeah. I just want the record to reflect that. Go ahead, please continue. Yeah, I, I'm sometimes better at it than, but it was this harsh kind of thing. And uh, I, I just, I kept the door open and I don't remember the man's name. I said, Mr. So-and-so, uh, don't go, there's someone I that, needs to meet you I, really I wonder if Letitia has read this book of hers I wonder if she knows this story and if so when she learned the story just curious um, really meant there's someone you know Billy when I, I was talking with Marie and she said that so and so had never bothered her sexually I said, did, did anything ever happen to Marie uh, or whatever? And uh, says, the only way I can talk about it is saying Billy. And Billy, uh, Billy said, I said, did the father ever do anything? And she said, or he, sure he did. And she, uh, she said, when she was, I don't remember if it was two or four, he put pencils in her rectum when she was, I believe he said, well, when she was 12, he had sex with her. And it had been denied. Marie had absolutely denied this. I could have left there, decided that the attorneys were. I did a video, I can't remember which, which one or how long ago, at referring to amnesic barriers. And what she's describing here is an example of exactly that. You can get someone with dissociative identity disorder who has gone through something horrible and really denies it and, and really will say, no, I absolutely don't believe that this happened, but the alternate personality knows about it. 100 cases at that point, that month, at Bellevue, in that particular clinic, there were 100 cases. Now, this may be piddling for an ordinary clinic, but for a particular specialty kind of clinic on an offbeat disorder, uh, I thought that it would at least... I'm waiting for him to, to interrupt her because she's kind of rambling off. He asked her how many diagnoses she made and she's telling this whole other story and he's kind of just turning the pages there. Hmm. Maybe he's waiting for her to ramble something out that he can use. I, I don't know. At least support and itself. There were a hundred yeah. visits. I should say there were a hundred visits to Bellevue uh, to that clinic. So uh, that gives you some idea. Of, uh... <laughs> it, it, He's what he's doing. He's not even listening to her. <laughs> the poor court reporter, man, she has to type all this. <laughs> he's finding his next spot. Like he's, he's not even tuned in. He's finding his next spot to, in her book there. Uh, of the number of, of cases that. But you made that diagnosis more often since the Marie case. Of course. Would you say a hundred times? I, I, I really don't know, it would be a guess, but certainly I'm, I know how to interview better now. I, uh, you know, I know how to interpret things better now than I did then. And, uh, you know. 
That makes sense. Once you learn something and you become better at it, that that makes sense. She's going to recognize it more often. Uh, you say Jonathan and I have been able to trace clues of multiple personality disorder all the way back to early childhood. Yes. Teacher reports, social service, excuse me, social service records, medical charts, letters to friends and relatives, journals, diaries, drawings, all are all pieces of the puzzle that when fitted together reveal the picture of a divided, often fragmented mind. It often did. This prosecutor has just turned her into his witness. That was good. Correct. What things of that sort. I, but just, uh, what, what, I, what I was trying to say is that uh, <laughs> when we make a diagnosis, I pretty much insist that there has to have been evidence that this existed long before I ever set eyes on the person or the person set eyes on me. And Ooh, that's critical. So an expert is saying what she just said. I don't need to repeat it to you. So does that mean we're going to hear about the evidence in Letitia's case? Because so far, I can't even figure out when she was diagnosed. So... Uh, this is this is really interesting. There would be evidence all over the place in her words and insisting on that other prior evidence prior to the crime. Uh, uh, very uh, hospitals, often. all sorts of things. And uh, <clears throat> I insist that whatever it is, have uh, or try at least to have uh, evidenced itself long before they saw me because uh, you're very open to being accused of suggesting and of uh, giving someone an idea that, oh, they must have this because you can suggest it. And this is why, uh, at least in our clinic, we would... Back in the 80s, there were scandals about this. There were scandals about therapists trying to uncover this and actually giving people um, post-hypnotic suggestions and uh, planting seeds and, and bringing up memories that didn't actually happen. And uh, I can't hear myself. And the client would have this memory that wasn't true but the client believes it's true, so the client is actually traumatized. So there, yeah, there was this this big scandal, and having that suggestion made to a vulnerable person, or a person maybe wanting to get out of a criminal conviction, would be pretty a pretty important little bit here. By just looking back, because you can usually look back and find evidence of, let's say, different names and different signatures. You can very often, uh, you can find different artistic styles and different signatures at the bottom of them. It seems to me that family members might be very relevant to interview with regards to if not their loved one. If they would. Disassociative identity disorder, correct? Well, there's one fallacy there, which is very often the abuser has been a family member. And with Marie Moore, they came in together with saying next to nothing. Well, and let me, I'm going to talk uh, about this case. Okay. Well, but, uh, but family members are not necessarily the best in the world. Far better is looking back at what the person himself or herself has created prior to your the person interview. who created that may have a reason not to tell you the truth, right? Wrong. Uh, Wait a minute here. You just said a few minutes ago that you're skeptical going into these interviews because people who are charged with crimes may have a reason to fake it. You don't remember saying and that? And that is why you would have your data antedate any 
crime, any contact with them, because you can't retrospectively malinger. And it's vital for everyone to remember that you cannot retrospectively malinger. Oh, gee. I'm going to sign this painting differently because 10 years from now, I'm going to commit murder. Come on. Well, you, that is why you cannot, uh, you know, that's why you don't just take something that was produced after you met with the person. Why uh, like I want to replay that 10 times. You don't just take something that was produced after you met the person after the crime, when there's stakes as to whether or not you get this particular diagnosis. This, this is the defense witness. She is correct. What she's saying is, is right. She knows her stuff. She is correct. But, oh boy. Why you look back and- What about a daughter named Harley Hunt that had been with the defendant her whole life every day of her life. I don't think it'd be relevant to talk to her to see if she saw any signs of disassociative identity disorder. Oh, sure, it would be very helpful. And so what did Harley have to tell you when you talked talk to her? I, I asked the attorneys with whom I could speak, and I was not in touch with any of these people. And so I, you know, I did not, use them unless you're well if they had years before made some kinds of notations about the person that would be uh kosher you could probably look at that but uh you say in your book that there was a case in florida you were subpoenaed or, or asked to come and get opinions on and if they wouldn't do what you asked them to do an mri eg logical testing and you refused to testify. Remember that? I don't remember which case it was. No, this was written when in 86. I don't. Well, why didn't you I'm do sorry, that here? I don't recall that case. Why didn't you do that here? I tried. Why didn't you refuse to testify? Because you didn't have done what you wanted to have done. Perhaps guilt. I don't know why. I, uh, but and speaking of that, I probably should have. You were, you were to be here at nine o'clock this morning. Why? He's asking her why she didn't refuse to testify in Letitia's case. And she just said, I probably should have. Holy smokes. Were you not here at nine o'clock? I don't know. I was supposed to be here two weeks ago, and I was told that... You, you know there's discovery requirements for your report when you enter a criminal case of this nature that you need to give us your report 35 days before trial, correct? No, that, uh, this is new to me. However, uh, I did the best that I could. I could not provide you with uh, what you wanted until I got data. And even when I did not get the data, I did the best that I could with what I was given. And you provided, or at least somebody typed up a report that was given to us four days before we started jury selection. Do you have a disregard with the rules here? What's going on here? I don't think I have a disregard for the rules. I don't think I have a disregard for the rules. Pointing the finger at somebody there. I mean, these lawyers are looking terrible. Um, I don't know what is actually going on. I I think there must be reasons. Otherwise, they'd be jumping up and down. This is interesting. I I think they're probably more crazy than insane uh, disorders. How's that? Okay. Uh -huh. <clears throat> Legal insanity is a pretty high calling. It is where? <laughs> well, I talked to you about Colorado, but I'm not sure you can. I, I now I'm going to have to go look up the exact uh, rule. I take it McNaughton does not fly in Colorado. 
Well, let me ask you a question about these reports that you alluded to in one of your answers. You said, based on what your expert reports said, you remember saying that in one of your answers? Uh, no, I don't, but go ahead. Well, what report, reports are you referring to? I don't know what report you're referring to. Well, there's only um, one report with regards to insanity in this case, other than yours, correct? As far as I know. That's and that, that's the report by Dr. Gray and Dr. Torres. Correct? Didn't you say one of my reports? Aren't they people that are from your side of the? Uh... Your side? Didn't, weren't those evaluations ordered by the court? Those first ones? Or did the, mm. well, that's interesting. It, in, in any case, it's interesting for an expert to say that at all, because if you're an expert going in, you're supposed to look at, at the case and evaluate, evaluate it through your lens of expertise, through your experience and education. And it doesn't matter what, who paid you, right? because you're supposed to be the expert. You're supposed to be helping uh, get to the truth. Well, that's what I'm asking you. Why do you think they're on our side? Because they work for the state. Okay. Well, you work for the state. You're getting paid by the state. I, I don't know who I'm getting paid by, but I, I assume that they're working on your side because you have, you have asked them, had you asked me to evaluate uh, Leticia, I probably would have said, yes, I'd be glad to evaluate Leticia. Would it be, would it surprise you that the court is the one that actually asked the state hospital to do a neutral evaluation? No, it would not. However, when you ask the state to do this, the state is the one that is, uh, the people there are being paid by the state and it is usually, uh, with that slant, just as when a public defender gets a case, it is usually slanted in that direction. Are you basing that just because they found her? I have no words right now. Her legally sane at the time? that somehow we brought them into this case? No, I'm not basing it on anything. I don't know them. I don't know. So you have no idea how Dr. Gray and Dr. Torres became involved in this evaluation? I'm assuming that they were requested by you or by the court to do this evaluation. When she says requested by you, <clears throat> and then adds or requested by the court, she is implying wittingly or not. And I don't know, because th this, this is a smart woman. She's implying that the court would order an assessment slanted toward the prosecution. Th this is, this is wild, man. You said that you read 100 pages of police reports? I didn't recall giving a number. I said hundreds of pages of different reports. How long did it take you to get through all that information? Hours. Thousands and thousands of pages, right? I don't know, hundreds, certainly. Reports from the FBI, correct? I would have to go over it. I, I know I carried a suitcase here that weighed uh, probably over 100 pounds, but I don't know how many pages. Reports from the El Paso County Sheriff's Office, correct? Probably. You review those? I, dozens and dozens of reports, yes. What about reports from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina? Did you review those? I would have to look over this again. I, Cause again, I looked at these a while back, but I did bring them with me. So if you wanted me to look over what I have with me, I can tell you. 
what she's saying makes sense. If you have a big case or a complicated case with tons and tons of information, you do read through all this stuff. And if somebody asks you, oh, this particular report on this particular day, and, and you've got a stack of banker's boxes, you don't know, right? If that's exactly what that person said on that day from that police department, you get your you get your picture, you pick up details, and, and you're not necessarily going to be able to point to anything in particular. Um, and, and certainly with that volume of information, you're not going to be reading something like that the night before a trial. Well, tell me what you recall reviewing. I would have to look at them. I don't recall the name of each place in each, uh, each organization. Mr. Tolini asked you questions about him being in the interview room while you're conducting the evaluation. You remember him asking you that? Yes. Do you remember giving three answers? One, want them to see what I see. That was your first answer, correct? Right. And you knew this was being videotaped, correct? Right. Why couldn't they just watch the video? In my experience, it is helpful for me to have the person who is responsible for the case to see what I see. Another reason would be, <clears throat> I've said to them, you know, try not to interrupt me if you can avoid it, but if there is something toward the end or something that you feel I need to know that I've just Depending on the personality of the attorney and depending on the personality and issues of the client and actually a whole lot of other things, having another person in the room, having your attorney in the room can really change the, the dynamic. Say The other thing is with dissociation, a person can switch on a dime. And if you look at the uh, at the tapes, you'll see that a person, just as they can switch uh, an accent, and it just happens, and you barely notice it and you see it, uh, a person can switch on a dime in terms of how they perceive you. And uh, you can be safe one minute. This uh, yeah. friend of mine was stabbed shortly before I arrived there to uh, to interview the defendant. And I was not permitted to do the interview and that was that. But no, I do not think that the third day I'm necessarily safe on my own. I would be a fool. But you that. talked about someone switching on a dime. You didn't diagnose this stuff with disassociative identity. 2023. Why were you concerned about her switching on a dime if you hadn't made a diagnosis? Because I don't know when I come and see a patient what the disorder is, and there are other disorders in which. It, it's not just whether or not it's dissociative identity disorder or some other disorder. People are dangerous for a variety of reasons. And the fact of the matter is that having DID or any number of other mental illnesses does not make you violent or unable to control yourself. There are plenty of people in prison who are violent and can turn on a dime and they don't have any mental defect or disorder. They're not legally insane. So this is kind of a funny line of questioning. I think what he's after really is trying to squash her her reasons for having the attorney in the room uh, but i think he, he's as far as he's going to get with that i could be wrong someone can switch on a dime and uh, also uh i believe her degree was a uh a computer you know an internet and she succeeded in life had a daughter married twice wow Right? And then all of a sudden, out of nowhere. I do, why would you say succeeded, married twice? This is not a, a victory. She didn't murder anybody. 
She didn't murder anybody within that 20 year period. But she managed to marry some really unpleasant people. I'd say those were big mistakes. She's married twice and married some really unpleasant people. People, plural. So she's referring to both of them. I wonder what Letitia to told her about Al. I mean, I know nothing about Al or their marriage. Um, but you got to wonder how she's portraying everything, anything to this doctor. And just when do you think her disassociative identity disorder started? Wow. I, I don't know with her. I, if you were to ask me earliest, the first uh, patient at our clinic was four years old. He's asking about Letitia. When did Letitia develop DID? Because it's critical. And she's answering about another case here. Hmm. You didn't think that was important for your opinion to give this jury when her diagnosis started? Only if I knew it. Yeah, well, you know, you reviewed the jail records in this case, right? But they're incomplete. And they're, uh, we don't have enough data to say when this started. Well, it started when she said it started after June 5th, when her competency was raised in court. You remember reading that? It doesn't matter what she says when she says something started. In fact, Dr. Torres specifically asked her during the competency evaluation. You it doesn't matter what she says, but unless, <laughs> unless they say something different going forward, so far, all they really have is what she said. That's what they're basing their opinions it, that land in her favor on. Hmm. You answered a question. Of I don't know. Would that be significant in your opinion? I would have to know the whole context of it. In fact, it wasn't until the second competency evaluation with Dr. Grimmett that disassociative identity disorder became an issue in this case, right? I believe you, I don't know that for sure, but I, I, it certainly I could be. Tend not to ask for alternative people to come and talk to. Well, you asked Maria Sanchez to talk to you. Only because she told me Maria existed, I had, I had not heard of Maria and uh, you know, so I would say, is it possible to talk to her particularly because she did give us a clue that Maria Sanchez is a very violent character and there are guns and there are all sorts of things. So that of course I would want to say, is it possible to talk to this person? I'm Hold on a second. So this, this doctor knows enough to know not to try and elicit an alternate personality uh, without first being sure that the client has dissociative identity disorder. And God, like maybe I've missed it somewhere, but I still uh, haven't seen anything concrete as to who diagnosed her with DID based on what and on what date um did did they say a date of a report that that was the date of her diagnosis that preceded any in, interviews see in any interviews where they would elicit maria I'm missing some here. Maybe, maybe they'll say so. I'm not saying I want you to talk to me, but is it possible for me to talk to so and so? I don't invite a trigger. But what you did here is, hey, can I talk to Maria Sanchez? And all of a sudden, fake accent comes out and she starts talking. I didn't. I don't even know if Maria San, Maria Sanchez sounds to me. She sounds Hispanic, and whatever talked to me sounded Russian without Russian words, but sounded Russian. 
I don't think Maria Sanchez and the Russian words were the same. You know, but what you said on direct is yeah. that she spoke Russian. You didn't say no, it sounded Russian. I didn't. I said it sounded Russian. I would ask the jury to <laughs> confirm this. Why couldn't I said it were not words? I just get one question in. Why is it that Dr. Torres can ask her, "Can I speak to Maria Sanchez?" Can't change. She says, "I'm not able to change that persona." But when you ask, she's able to change. Magic. Okay, those are my questions. The answer is trust. Just for today, we'll start tomorrow morning. The answer is trust, if it was real. Um, if it's not real, she's just gonna do whatever she thinks is gonna get her the furthest. And if she believes that Dr. Lewis is going to believe her, then she can go ahead and turn into Maria. This this Russian thing is bizarre. Um, and that she would speak in a Russian accent and say things that maybe sound Russian, but they're not really words. That's that's bizarre. I, I don't I don't know how you could Put that down to, to DID because that sounds like something else altogether. Anyway, this video is ended. I'm tired. I don't know where Watson is. Um, and so I'm going to try and see if there are spots I can cut out and get this out to you. Um, yeah, see if you like this format. It's not as involved as the other way. But we'll see what you think. Thanks.